We've talked a lot about Canon films here at Real Action, and for good reason. No other studio made a bigger mark in the 80s with their brand of over-the-top, low-budget, big-payoff action flicks. As run by Israeli cousins Menahem Golan and Yoram Globus, Canon not only knew how to follow the trends, but to start some of their own. They helped kick off the ninja craze of the 80s with Enter the Ninja, and as fun as that was, its star Franco Nero, eh, well, not so much. It was awesome co-star Sho Kasugi who caught everyone's attention, and so Canon enlisted him for 1983's Revenge of the Ninja, the awesome second chapter of Canon's Ninja Trilogy. Only a ninja can stop a ninja. Let's go. So while they call it the Ninja Trilogy, Canon's trio of flicks are completely disconnected from one another, except for the presence of Sho Kasugi. Say what you want about Canon films and the eventual path to destruction that they took, but they knew how to create action stars and how to follow trends. Enter the Ninja was a natural step from the martial arts flicks of the 70s, and while it was a hit, people wanted to see the guy who smashed it as the villain, Kasugi get his moment to shine without having to carry someone like Nero. So in a Revenge of the Ninja, in which Kasugi plays the good guy, Cho Osaki, whose Japanese family is wiped out by a clan of ninja rivals. And this opening sequence is no joke. We're talking women getting gutted, and even a little kid taking a throwing star to the dome. Ruthless. But it's a tone setter. Because when Cho shows up and sees all the death around him, he goes wild and kicks the shit out of the ninjas all by himself. When the fighting is over, he hangs up his sword and takes up his American friend Braden's offer to open a Japanese art gallery in America. An odd place of employment for a ninja, you'd think he'd be like personal security or a sushi chef or something. Perhaps he should've because Cho finds out the gallery is actually just a front for a drug smuggling operation, discovered by his curious young son because kids always ruin a good thing. The whole criminal ring is being led by a mysterious ninja who isn't afraid to kill anyone who gets in his path. Revenge of the Ninja is a far and away superior film to Enter the Ninja, and it all starts with the casting of Kasugi. A renowned karate champion, Kasugi was simply able to pull off athletic feats that Nero wouldn't have dared attempt. He instantly gave the film credibility, which when you're living in the time of Bruce Lee and other martial arts greats, was priceless in the world of movie making. Kasugi was more than just the star, however. He also did the fight choreography, and there's some spectacular stuff here that Western audiences had never laid eyes on before. This was 1983, and American moviegoers had yet to get the full Jackie Chan experience. So it was Kasugi who introduced them to the agile, acrobatic style they would become accustomed to years later. It's safe to say that, along with Bruce Lee, Kasugi was among the first true crossover martial arts stars. And he deserves that title because Kasugi is incredible. There's an entire sequence here that starts with a fight and extends to a car chase with Kasugi running down a speeding vehicle and hanging on for dear life before crashing through the windshield that is better than anything you'll find in any action movie in the decade. While Kasugi was the perfect choice for this, the other part of the equation was director Sam Furstenberg. While Canon Films head Menem Golan caused a stir when he took over the direction of Enter the Ninja, Revenge of the Ninja was Furstenberg's show. The pairing was spot on. Furstenberg's camera is more than capable of keeping pace with the frenetic Kasugi and coming up with some really unique combat scenarios that make the best use of the actors and the ninja weaponry on display. That's another thing this movie does really well. Show off the complete ninja arsenal, 
which isn't just relegated to swords, knives, and nunchucks. There's also ninja mysticism that, while a bit corny when put on display, captured the imaginations of young kids everywhere who just thought it was some cool mumbo jumbo. Furstenberg would become a canon staple, whose career was forever tied to the ninja boom. He would go on to direct a killer final chapter of the ninja trilogy, Ninja 3 The Domination. Having a big hand in the star-making turn of Michael Dudikoff, Furstenberg would direct the actor in American Ninja and American Ninja 2, The Confrontation. He would follow that with the extremely controversial racially charged anti-war film Riverbend, which has exactly zero ninjas in it, and break into Electric Boogaloo, which has Lucinda Dickey, who starred in Ninja 3 The Domination alongside Kasugi, so it was at least ninja adjacent. Kasugi helped make Revenge of the Ninja a family affair as well, and what would become a fairly typical thing for Kasugi, he cast his son Kane Kasugi as, well, Cho's son Kane. Yeah, the little brat who started this whole mess. Kane would become part of an 80s trend of little kids kicking ass on the big screen. Kane is actually quite the little badass too, getting one really great fight with sexy co-star Ashley Ferreira even though you can tell he can't resist gawking at her uh, uh, shurikens. My karate training is more than enough. I just want you to teach me the way. Well, if you want to work out, you forgot your pants. You really think I forgot? <laughs> Kane and his brother Shane would appear in more films alongside their father, usually as comedic siblings in films such as Pray for Death and Black Eagle, which featured an early role for some dude named John claude Van Damme? Van Damme. Wonder whatever happened to that guy. Kane also starred as Ryu Hayabusa in my all-time favorite live-action video game adaptation, DOA Dead or Alive. Look, don't judge me, okay? Kasugi wasn't all alone in carrying the action either. Keith Vitale, a karate champion once ranked number one in the world, has a decent role as Cho's well-intentioned friend Dave Hatcher. Dave won't take no for an answer when asking to help Cho in his ninja fight, and, well, he pays a pretty steep price for being such a boy scout. But it seems like everyone in this movie can fight. Even grandmother knows her stuff until, well, she, she probably should have stuck to baking cookies like the other grandmas. There's also a really weird role for professional wrestler, martial artist, and the running man Sub-Zero, Professor Tanaka, as a lecherous sumo who gets too handsy and pays for it. Sure. It's been 40 years, but I still want people to discover this movie for themselves, so I won't give away the actor who plays the evil Silver Devil Ninja. However, stuntman Steve Lambert took over when there was any fighting that needed to be done because the other actor wasn't capable. And Lambert is actually really impressive. He and Kosugi choreographed a lot of the action, and Lambert also played other ninja who got their butts whooped. Despite lacking Nero's star power, Revenge of the Ninja did nearly as well as Enter the Ninja, earning around $14 million at the box office while doing even better in VHS sales. That might not sound like a ton, but the film cost only 750 k This was the canon sweet spot, and if they had just stuck to that rather than flushing away millions on films such as Life Force, Over the Top, and more, 
who knows, maybe they'd still be around chugging away? Then again, Canon also had a way of pissing off their biggest stars too. Kasugi was no different. While he would return for 1984's Ninja 3 The Domination, Kasugi would split from Canon over money disputes. What else? It would never have quite the same impact. He got out of the movie business for a long time, but would make a splashy return in 2009's Ninja Assassin, playing the villainous Lord Ozuno. The Ninja boom sort of fizzled out shortly after the Ninja trilogy anyway, but perhaps it would have lasted longer if the relationship between Kasugi and Canon had stayed tight. In a way, it's nuts that this film became so popular with kids. My friends and I used to have sleepovers and watch Revenge of the Ninja. It's incredibly violent, with Kasugi alone killing 16 people in increasingly lethal fashion. There's a reason Revenge of the Ninja is considered among the best action movies canon ever produced, and we may not see its like again for a long time. Revenge of the Ninja gets 9 out of 10 Stallones. So you, you, brought, <laughs> you brought him up, uh, Shokasugi. Uh, I think between him and you, you guys were like largely responsible for the, the ninja craze of the 80s. I was, like I said, I was a, a kid growing up in the 80s and I was obsessed with ninja uh, because, of, because of the movies you, you two did together. Uh, talk to me a little bit about, about him, what he was like on the set of Revenge of the Ninja, uh, your first time uh, really working together. Okay. Okay, Shokasugi, it's interesting, a subject that came up this morning on an email, I thought oh. I was in with somebody. <laughs> I, did, as I, I did not know anything about martial arts. I mean, I knew that there were dojos and people are, kids are practicing martial arts, karate. At the time it was karate, 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 kung fu and karate. But I didn't know anything. I'm not uh, part of this world. I'm not athletic anyway. I was never part of the, this world never met anyone who was uh, practicing right. any martial art. And then I met Shokasugi, and I didn't understand. Shokasugi was not only a martial artist, black belt, champion of Japan, sensei with uh, hundreds of students, with schools. I didn't understand what it means <laughs> <laughs> because I met him one-on-one. -on -one. Later I met him with his students. I, I understood his status. I, but at that point, I didn't understand nothing. <laughs> So the nice thing, mm. again, later on, I met people who are very vigilant about the purity of martial art. Luckily, Shokasugi was crazy about Hollywood. His ambition was to become Hollywood star, not to become martial arts star. He wanted to be Chuck Norris. Mm. So this is different from people which I met later, which are purists about martial art. Yeah. So this was good because we both had the same direction that we were striving for. And, and he was gracious to me. Again, I, didn't, I did not understand his status in the world of martial art at all. Right. I didn't know at the beginning. So he was gracious. He was, he was open to me. And, and you know, he, of course, he understood. He saw that I don't understand. I don't know anything. And he taught me. He, he, he took me in my hand and into the world of martial arts, specifically the world of ninja, which was totally unfamiliar, by the way, in the Western world at all. And you know, and he showed me sequences, etc. Then on the reverse side, on the set, when he was choreographing fights, when he was putting together the martial art fight, I did not intervene in the stage of planning because I understood immediately by instinct that he knows not much more than me, like a right. million fold than me in this how to put together a martial art. And uh, on the set, he was always surrounded by eight of his students. They were, it was a crew, you know, and together they, they had their own language and they put together sequences. And usually they came, when they were ready, they came and showed me. So there was always this, uh, the, there is a moment of rehearsal or something. They show the director the sequence. 
And I could, I, and if I had to judge it, or it, it, I, if I had to veto anything, it was not on the movement. My, my, my intervening was not on the pure movements of martial art, but rather I always strive that every sequence, even if it's a fight sequence, will have a little story within it. Right. Not just two people chopping at each other. Yeah, yeah. There is a little story. The good guy uh, goes down, the bad guy prevails, the villain prevails, and the, the hero takes over. I mean, there is a little drama. So my comments, my veto, my encouragement was always on the storytelling of the fight sequence, of the wave that the fight goes down and up and ended up in a crescendo you know, reaches a peak at the end, uh, that it's satisfying, that it's exciting, not the, yeah. again, I said, not just two people tackling each other endlessly with yeah. no end. So the, and he understood, and he, and he respected my point of view. I respected his point of view. Now, the truth is that many cultural, I, I did not sync with him on many, few cultural uh, elements. He came from Japan, from another completely different set of uh, mm -hmm. cultural codes. I came from Israel, from completely, uh, you know, Israelis are very direct, are very open, not like the Japanese, which are full of uh, ceremonial and codes of behavior, etc. So here and there we clashed. The, our biggest clash was actually post-production later. When we finished the movie, that's a good story. <laughs> when we finished the movie, we realized the editing was done. The, it's hard to understand Shaw. Shaw had a very heavy, at, at least at that time, you know, very heavy uh, uh, Japanese accent. It was yes. very hard to understand it. So naturally, in the Hollywood mechanism, we hired an actor, a, a voice actor, yep. to replace his voice and do it in a Japanese action, uh, accent, but mm. you know, Americanized English, Japanese yeah. accent. Yeah. And, I didn't even bother to ask his permission, not even to let him know that we are doing it because in our upset. professional mind, you do just the best thing for the movie. You don't ask the, the, the star yeah. of the movie. Eventually we had the screening, the first screening of the movie, edited music, <laughs> and the show is invited. Of course, he was the major part yeah. of the movie. And he's sitting there and he realized that it's not his voice. <laughs> <laughs> he came to me at the end of the screening. <clears throat> Maybe not at the fact that we did it, but at the fact that I did not ask him. He's such a yeah important sensei with so many followers, and I didn't even bother to tell him that was I'm changing. Was he mad? Was he mad? So this was a major <laughs> clash between. <laughs> was he? I said, Sean, this is standard procedure. He was I, mad. You should was... have asked me, etc. It it was a matter of honor. He was so he wasn't mad. He was angry. Respect, or... respect, and honor. Okay. That's, that's cool. That's, that's an awesome story. Thank you for watching our show. If you like what you see, please subscribe to our channel. Tell your friends who like this sort of content and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all of our latest videos. We're an independent company and we appreciate all of your support.